now we have the second paper by Christian Koch, who will be speaking about the Gulf and Europe and the change of dynamism, dynamics, sorry. Mr. Koch is the head of Mark Al Khalid Center for Research in Geneva and worked for 16 years in the Emirates before come, going to Geneva. He focuses in his research on issues related to international affairs of the GCC countries. He has published six books and papers and articles in several journals. I give the floor to Mr. Christian Koch. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a good late morning or a good early afternoon to everybody. Um, let me at the outset, of course, also thank uh, the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies for the opportunity to be here. I think it certainly has been a very insightful and interesting two days so far of uh, discussions, uh, and I'm also looking forward to this one. Let me look at the Gulf-Europe relationship sort of in three parts. The first thing is where do we stand, where have relations proceeded so far? Um, then what are some of the current issues that I think will potentially uh, impact the relationship a little bit more negatively? Uh, and so I will go through those. And then what's sort of the outlook and also what can uh, this part of the world, what can the GCC states do to bring these relations back uh, to a more balanced uh, equation? I think when we look, of course, uh, at where our relations at the moment, we have very much a, uh, what I would sort of call a mixed bag. Um, we have to, of course, distinguish between the multilateral uh, relationship that exists at an institutional level between the GCC and the EU, and we have to look at the bilateral level where we have the individual relationships between uh, GCC countries and individual European states. Um, at the multilateral level, GCC EU level, uh, we of course we have a formal cooperation agreement in place uh, that's been there since 1988, uh, which represents really the first regional agreement that the GCC entered with, with another uh, multilateral organization. Uh, and there are a number of channels of communications that go on on a regular basis. Annual summits take place. Uh, they have uh, been so uh, now since 1989, since the beginning of the former relationship. So we've had 25 joint ministerial meetings happening every year. We have a number of committees that exist, uh, economic committees, political dialogue taking place. Uh, some functional issues, like there's a committee on combating uh, terrorist financing. Um, so there is some communication going on. Uh, but at the same time, I think we also have a number of instances where cooperation has not uh, reached its potential. Uh, early on, the both sides started negotiation over a free trade agreement, uh, but that free trade agreement has never come about. And actually, since 2008, we have had no further negotiations on the possibility of the free trade agreement. Uh, in 2010, the two sides agreed on a uh, joint action program identifying 14 concrete areas of cooperation, uh, but that agreement was scrapped after three years uh, with both sides sort of complaining that uh, there was nothing substantial to show for. Um, I think what we also have, of course, is a little bit of a, a lack of a EU strategy towards the Gulf. There's never been sort of an, a, a document that we have outlining what are the EU objectives in the region. Uh, all we've had is simply a number of statements going back to uh, uh, 2000 and uh, for the EU strategic partnership with the Mediterranean and Middle East document, where the EU commits itself to advancing a partnership. Uh, we've had a larger EU parliamentary document on improving relations with the GCC, uh, and even the last summit, the 25th ministerial meeting, has called for an enhancing political dialogue and cooperation. But these are, these are basically statements that have really uh, resulted in very little concrete action when we're looking at what's happening in terms of promoting a more strategic aspect to the relationship. The same thing a little bit on the bilateral level. Well, of course, this relationship is more dominated by uh, you know, the so-called big three, uh, the UK, France, and, and, and Germany. 
um, UK and France simply because they, of course, are the two members of the uh, UN Security Council. Uh, so there's been a lot of emphasis on promoting the relationship with these individual countries. Um, and they've been very good in terms of, of course, for example, diversifying arms purchases. That's been a good aspect uh, for both sides. But even those relationships are very, not really effective outside the EU framework. Uh, I think the, even uh, here, the, the individual countries mostly follow their commercial interests when it comes to the region. Uh, and they let sort of the U.S. To, to take care of the rest of the region in terms of security. So, I mean, that was very interesting. Yesterday we had a strong debate in the uh, U.S. elections uh, session where we talked about free riders. Uh, well, I think here the EU certainly is a free rider in terms of benefiting from what others do in terms of providing stability for the region, whereas EU companies can come in and gain uh, commercial contracts. Uh, and it's also a case that the... Uh, individual countries do not necessarily go to Brussels and say, let's uh, devise an EU policy towards the Gulf. Uh, they pursue this individually uh, and they don't push forward with uh, sort of a more concerted action inside Brussels. Um, so I think we are we're at, a, we're at a difficult phase here. On the one hand, we have these uh, structural impediments that impact the relationship. Uh, the EU's bottom-up approach doesn't necessarily fit with the GCC's top-down approach when you have in terms of decision-making. I think a lot of times there's a misunderstanding in terms of how things and how decisions are made. Uh, the EU doesn't, and European countries don't necessarily understand that decisions here in the region are made very much at the personal level and they don't invest enough time in developing those uh, relationships. I think the Gulf states also don't understand that decisions in Europe are done much more institutionally, uh, and therefore they don't spend enough time in approaching the relevant institutions uh, uh, in Europe to promote the relationship. Uh, and of course we have this problem between the bilateralism and the multilateralism, uh, which sort of always presents a dichotomy. So in that sense we are definitely below expectations. Um, I also think that when you look at uh, the factors that are currently playing a role, uh, especially also in Europe, but also, of course, here in the region, uh, we have the potential of even relations becoming a little bit more tense. Um, on the economic side, I think it's basically okay. Uh, definitely, economics is the main driver of the relationship. Here, we've seen a tremendous uh, increase, even in the trade volumes, a uh, 50% increase just alone since 2010. Uh, I think it, it's about now 155 billion, the last figure I know in trade volumes. There also continues to be strong golf investments in Europe, which was an important factor in, in Europe being able to relatively smoothly ex exit the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, but I'm, I sort of am doubtful that this overall mo momentum is going to be maintained at the same level. I think we have shifting trade patterns already. Uh, the, the Gulf region is developing much more extensive economic ties with Asia. I think we have uh, more competition in the region as, of course, Gulf countries are going through economic diversification efforts. And with the low oil price, of course, sort of these unlimited economic opportunities that existed are coming to an end. Also at the multilateral level, the EU as an economic model is losing a little bit of its model character. Uh, EU is going through a number of, of issues, including the, the crisis within the Eurozone. Uh, so overall, you know, there's less enthusiasm, uh, which I find here in the region, about necessarily following the EU character. Then on the political sort of strategic front, I think there are three areas that are going to present a little bit of a problem. Already we've seen since in the sort of uh, uh, post-Arab spring period that the EU and European, individual European countries have started to criticize a little bit more the political developments in the region. We see numerous uh, resolutions haven't been passed by the EU Parliament on Bahrain, for example. We actually had the first time the cancellation of the joint ministerial meeting in 2014 uh, due to this apparent, uh, what, the e, uh, what the Gulf countries said was an interference in the domestic affairs of Bahrain. Uh, now this has continued uh, since about 2011 and we see overall an increasingly negative uh, public perception about Gulf policies. Uh, we see that there's uh, this questioning whether the Gulf states are doing enough to combat terrorism. Um, and I mean, there's, there's sort of again this dichotomy that comes out when you're looking at EU policies. On the one hand, 
Uh, there's this argument that the Gulf states are not doing enough on reform, they need to do more. On the other hand, when you talk to people in Brussels lately, they're almost uh, at a point where they're saying, well, you shouldn't go too fast. Uh, you know, it's nice to do reforms, but don't, uh, you know, don't, don't rush it too much and create further instability. So that's going to be a problem that's going to continue, uh, I think, especially if we look a little bit of where also the new U.S. administration is going, with maybe less of an emphasis on in the political developments, on issues such as human rights by the Trump administration, which a lot of people expect. That sort of whole uh, aspect is going to fall onto the Europeans, uh, and they're going to try to push this issue uh, every now and then, which will then create certain discord here with, uh, with uh, Gulf uh, governments, for sure. We also have the fact, of course, that the EU is going to be, in the next period, very much preoccupied by itself. Uh, Brexit was just the first uh, instance now where we have very much few doubts about the future of European integration. Uh, we had the vote yesterday in Italy, uh, likely votes next year in France uh, and in Holland, which further could go into this nationalistic uh, uh, discourse. Um, so there's a lot of internal debate now uh, about the refugees, uh, about further populism, um, about debt issues that are not resolved. The Greek debts is, is again one thing that's coming to the forefront. And all of this really means that it's going to be very difficult for the Gulf to sort of gain the attention of policy officials in Europe because they're going to be so preoccupied. Uh, Brexit is not just the, 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 the one vote now for the Britain leaving. This is going to be an issue that's going to be with the EU for the next two to five years, uh, almost on a daily basis. Uh, so all of this consumes the EU very much. Um, and then uh, we also have this problem a little bit that in this changing strategic environment in, in the Gulf, where the Gulf states are becoming more active on a foreign policy front, uh, this is not something that necessarily all European states will agree with. I mean, again, a little bit of a dichotomy. On the one hand, you've been arguing for a long time in Europe that the Gulf states should be more active, that they should take care of more of their regional affairs. But then when the Gulf states do, and you, know, you see some of the actions, maybe as far as Libya is concerned, or supporting groups in Syria, or what, what has happened in Yemen, immediately there's this criticism about, oh, well, that's not what we want you to do. Uh, so it gets very hard to, to sort of create where the basis on that is. Uh, and it certainly has already resulted in a little bit of backlash. Give me just one and a half more minutes. Um, uh, here, a lot of criticism, for example, about the arms exports that you see now, uh, especially in Germany and Britain. Um, so where do we go from here? Well, I think we have to realize that we're going to have possibly these higher number of disagreements uh, and possibly a little bit more uh, of, 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 of tensions. Um, I think the two things that the Gulf definitely can do is that the one thing is you need to engage even more with Europe. I think there's a lack of engagement that we still have in trying to explain also your positions. I don't see many people going to Brussels, for example. I don't see uh, many delegations, much Gulf uh, presence uh, going to see national parliaments. The emphasis has always been on the top leadership, but there's not been much emphasis on trying to engage with the institutions in the region. I think more exchange of visits between universities, between journalists, there's more engagement with journalists to give them the idea of what the Gulf positions are and try to uh, convince people that this is, should not, not only be seen in a negative light. Um, and then finally, I think on the more security st uh, strategic front, uh, I think much more emphasis should be given to developing a relationship between uh, the GCC and NATO. Uh, NATO has the Istanbul Cooperation Initiative out there since 2004. There's already four countries that are part of it. Saudi Arabia needs to become part of the relationship with NATO. But you have numerous advantages here, including the fact that you, with the Brexit, you're going to leave the UK out of the EU common and foreign security policy. But you have them within NATO. You have Turkey within NATO. You have the US within NATO. And I think that structure is something that you should consider when looking at your security relationship. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christian Koch, uh, for this uh, paper that uh, actually summarized uh, many factors uh, that uh, deeply affect uh, the near future of the strategic relations between Europe and the Gulf region, including uh, and not uh, limited to the uh, multilateral uh, relations between uh, the European Union and the GCC. Yes, thank you. Um, just two comments on the one on the issue of the rise of populism and uh, uh, right movements in Europe. I think definitely this is going to show that without 
sort of engagement and without proper uh, communications between uh, with the Gulf, relations will in fact deteriorate, I think, uh, because you are now, similar to what's happening in the uh, United States, you're in a situation where foreign policy is no longer being sort of viewed as an opportunity, but increasingly being viewed in terms of the threats it presents. And this means you have a much more inward looking also Europe, much more looking at the domestic issues that define. And within that context, people will not, in Europe, will not go out and seek the opinions of others. They will simply uh, believe what's being written in the press, what's being distributed by the media, uh, and but what's being provided to them by uh, uh, the politicians. And in that uh, sort of framework, it's much more important for Gulf countries to engage with many different players on the other side so to try to avoid this kind of deterioration. Uh, um, the reason why, you know, engage with the GCC and not only the individual states, well, one, you know, if you have, uh, uh, if you promote common messages, unified messages at the GCC level, you're of course going to be much more effective uh, rather than just having single voices out there. Second thing is, despite all the fact about EU integration and the crisis of EU integration, still a lot of legislation now takes place in, in, in Brussels and not necessarily only in national governments. And here the European Parliament plays a big role. Uh, and I think here again, it's much more effective if you engage with that body uh, uh, rather than doing it only at the individual level because you'll have, you'll have a multiple impact. Uh, and we can see one concrete example already where lack of engagement with the EU uh, is kind of detrimental to the Gulf states, and that is the increased EU engagement towards Iran. Uh, it wasn't until the GCC states started complaining very loudly, also in Brussels, that they were not included in the negotiations over the nuclear agreement that the foreign and security advisor uh, head, uh, Federica Mogherini, actually made an effort to come to the Gulf and explain a little bit what the Gulf position is. Since then, she's been here a couple of times, but that's only because finally somebody told them that you, know, you can't just exclude the GCC countries when it comes to talking about uh, regional relations uh, that have an impact here on the ground. Thank you. Uh, and I think it's this engagement, this is why the EU is important uh, and you need to pursue it at both levels. Uh, I'm not saying one or the other, but it needs to be on both. Thank you, Mr. Christian. Sure.